Oh hi weirdos, Dan Rosbach here, your co-lead discussant at the Weird Book Book Club. Today we're trying something a little bit different. It's kind of a new book discussion format engineered by Sarah over at Hardcover Hearts. Basically, three of us booktubers all read the same novel and prepared a series of questions for each other based on our reading experiences. So beyond the obvious benefit of giving you three new perspectives to consider about Garth Greenwell's cleanness, aka rhymes with penis, that's right Garth Greenwell, I'm on to you. It's sort of an organic way for me to use this platform to promote other booktubers who I feel are adding a lot of great ideas into the critical discourse, and just generally a fun way to spend some time talking about books with my online buddies. So I want to say thank you to Sarah for keeping us organized throughout all this coronavirus craziness, and a special thank you to Leo at A Little Book Life for convincing me to give this novel a try in the first place. So basically, if you want to see the other thirds of this conversation, you should probably start with Sarah's video, which I will link in the description box below, where she kind of sets up this conversation and provides me a few leading discussion questions to keep the conversation flowing. I've done the same for Leo, who will be talking more about the end of the book. His video, which I've also linked in the description box below, is available for you to watch right now. Three videos for the price of one. Now that's some quality quarantine content if you ask me. Oh, and in a few days you should check back on Sarah's channel to see how she wraps up the entire conversation. That one you'll have to wait for. Okay, so if you started with Sarah's video, you're probably sufficiently up to speed about the general subject matter of Greenwell's book. I'm just going to dive right into Sarah's questions, and I think you'll be able to get a pretty fully fleshed out idea of what I took away from the reading experience. Okay, question one which I'll be reading off of my handy teleprompter over here. This is certainly a book that is getting a lot of critical praise from book critics, but a lot of panning from the general reading audience. What do you think about the critics' point of view and the readers' points of view in general? Does that play into your decision-making process at all in choosing the next book that you're going to read? Now, if you've been watching this channel for any amount of time, you've probably noticed that I generally tend to avoid new releases and critical darlings, because I want to feel when I sit down to record a video that I actually have something to contribute to the conversation, and I'm really, really slow when it comes to producing new content. So odds are by the time I get around to a new book, the critical discourse will be fairly well settled. But I will say that in this case, the divide between professional and amateur opinion was fairly intriguing to me. People whose literary interpretations I greatly respect on both sides of the equation were able to make truly convincing cases for why this book sucked and or ruled. For example, Alex from What Page Are You On? filmed an extremely compelling pan review in which he referred to portions of Greenwell's prose as something like softcore nonsense. And then from the world of people who are actually paid for reviewing books, we have Dustin Illingsworth, whose analysis in the Paris Review I quoted extensively in my review of Belladonna. In his review, Illingsworth dubbed Greenwell the poet of infinite longing, saying that the narrator's tendency and cleanness towards extensive self-reflection yields deep insights on what it means to be a human with competing allegiances between desire and shame. And in a weird way, I found myself agreeing with both Alex and Illingsworth throughout my own reading experience. But I'll get into that in greater detail in the next questions. But to sort of wrap up what it was about this book's reputation that made me interested to read it, you should know that being an inveterate pervert, I was really curious to see what it was about the depictions of sexuality in this book that were making so many people on YouTube uncomfortable. And spoiler alert, I have apparently reached a degree of sluttiness which makes me immune to even the dirtiest mainstream fiction. So that felt both like a personal accomplishment and a valuable reference point for the future. All right, next question. This book is structured as a series of short stories or vignettes that while they all occur from the same character's point of view, they're not actually arranged chronologically. So how do I feel about that structural choice? And I have to say, I think it was executed quite well. Greenwell is able to signpost his temporal shifts in a way that always felt natural and never really took you out of the plot. And coincidentally, some of the best books I've read so far this year have been non-linear. For example, Nazi Literature in the Americas by Roberto Bolaño, or The Street of Crocodiles by Bruno Schulz. I like when an author places that trust in the reader to pick up on some of the major resonances that occur from section to section, repeated symbols that start to take on new meanings as the context changes. For example, a strange weather event that first appears in the story as a kind of poetry prompt, and which later on seems to signal some of the discord in our narrator's romantic relationship with a young student who's identified only as R. And if this book 
cleanness can be said to have an overarching point. I would say that these organic symbolic shifts, they serve to remind us that even the most personal foundational portions of our identity can never be fully comprehended out of context because they're interconnected. They're always evolving and influencing one another. For example, early on in the novel, our narrator seems to feel that his affinity for some might call it extreme S&M sexual scenarios where one person is totally dominant and the other completely submissive, he sort of equates that desire with a sense of shame and personal failure that no matter how risky or morally complicated these scenarios become for him in practice, he will continue to seek them out. Whereas near the end of the novel, it's just such a scenario which allows the narrator to experience this total moment of catharsis where this ultra heightened sexual situation actually allows him to access and expel many of the negative emotions that kind of had him trapped in this endless cycle of self-loathing. Now, for slightly less complimentary reasons, I also think that the non-sequentialness of this book worked in its favor because if it were structured chronologically, the middle portion of the novel would actually come first. And that central portion of the story was actually the least engaging part of the book for me overall. So if that, in my opinion, weaker portion of the book had been presented first, I think it would have presented a much larger hurdle for the rest of the text to overcome. But by the time it emerged in the middle of the novel, I was already sufficiently sold on the strength of Greenwell's writing overall, and so I kept moving forward with an optimistic attitude that he would eventually be able to do something more interesting with this material later on. So just for clarification, the weaker, in my opinion, part of the novel that I'm referring to is the one detailing the narrator's romance with the younger Portuguese college student I've mentioned before. I'm averse to these sort of romantic plots, even in the greatest of novels, but there are particular elements of the narrator in cleanness, stuff I'll delve into more later on, that made his reflections on this relationship feel particularly insubstantial. Anyway, I'm straying too far from the main point, which is that Garth Greenwell's structural choices were 100% correct because they just so happen to align with my own personal tastes. That's how criticism works, right? All right, next question. This is a very introspective book told from the point of view of one person. What do you think of our unnamed protagonist? Again, I'm going to kind of split the difference and say that the way Greenwell situates us in his narrator's head was both compelling and frustrating. His particular brand of stream of consciousness-ish prose, did a great job of conveying the sense of immediacy. Not just whatever torrent of ideas might happen to be running through this guy's head at any given moment, but the deliberate weaving in of physical sensations and pleasures that make you feel like you're not just riding shotgun in his mind, you're actually inhabiting his whole body. And for a book that's dealing so explicitly with not just the complexities of abstract sexual identity, but also the constantly evolving dynamics of physical bump and grind sex, I think that opening up our experience as readers to the full range of senses that we use to experience and interpret reality did a lot to heighten the narration's overall impact. At the same time, I thought that limiting our understanding of this character largely to his observations about what is happening to him right now, in this moment, could make him feel irritatingly vague at times. Like, he makes these sort of grand statements about his relationship with R, and how it somehow completely transformed his understanding of his own sexual identity that for the first time in his entire life, with this one special man, he was actually able to experience lust without any sense of shame. Thus, the cleanness of the title. To which I would respond, but, like, why? What in his past had so deeply ingrained this equivalency between desire and dirtiness in his mind? What beyond his desire for a lasting relationship with R, as opposed to something more one-night standy, is so challenging to this preconceived notion that sex, particularly gay sex, and even more particularly kinky gay sex, must automatically equal guilt? We have absolutely no idea. And so, instead of seeming complex and insightful as he does in other areas of his thinking, he starts to sound just a lot more cliché. The fallen man, object of his own lusts, waiting to be redeemed by a pure romantic love. 
So yeah, the prose is stronger when you're actually in the moment with the narrator. He has a capacity for observation and analysis that was truly compelling. But that analytical tension starts to slacken and dissolve when he just starts stating these grand conclusions that have no apparent basis in the rest of the reality that he's constructed. Okay, final question. This book is getting a lot of buzz, particularly about its depictions of sex. Many people are very put off by explicit sex in literary fiction, and it seems even more so for gay sex. This might seem to signal that people want to keep their sex writing sequestered away in genre books like erotica and romance, but that it shouldn't be mixed in with their highbrow literary fiction. What do you think? Yeah, that strain of critical discourse, I believe, reveals more about the reader and their tastes and their own comfort level engaging publicly with sexual topics because people are going to see your review and maybe you're admitting to your audience that you saw some deeper meaning in this hardcore S&M scene and, like, what if they start to think you're some kind of degenerate pervert for trying to take this smut seriously? It's way easier and socially safer, probably, to dismiss it altogether and say, this does not belong in literature. But for comparison's sake, let's place this in the broader context of media entertainment that millions of people around the planet regularly consume and enjoy. Spend just like five minutes clicking around on Pornhub and you'll find way more kinky, transgressive stuff than anything that happens in cleanness. Plus, oh. I guarantee you those videos will have view totals that are 10, 100, 1,000 times larger than the total number of people who have read this novel from start to finish. So I just don't buy it that the book reading population would be so demographically distinct from the teeming hordes of porn watchers out there that they'd be so completely unprepared to engage with and even enjoy some mildly hardcore content that they bought at a supposedly respectable establishment like Barnes & Noble. And in an even more sinister sense, I think that these kinds of offhand dismissals and fake shock and outrage are just another means that polite society uses to erase or exclude non-conforming sexualities from the sphere of respectable art. Treating them as some kind of historical aberration as though nothing so extreme had ever been attempted in literature before. Who would dare? But like the Marquis de Sade wrote 120 Days of Sodom over three centuries ago, Georges Bataille and Jean Genet wrote shit that's way kinkier than Greenwell's novel. And they were plenty well-read and influential in the early and mid-1900s. Okay, my examples here might make it sound like this is a trend unique to horny French dudes, but trust me, it's not. My point is, you basically have to cover over or just completely ignore massive swaths of history if you're going to claim that erotic literature can't possibly have as profound a cultural impact as many of the establishment-approved classics. In short, I call homophobic bullshit. Overall, what's my verdict on cleanness? If you're still watching me ramble on at this point, you probably deduced already that my feelings were generally positive with some considerable caveats. A classic Goodreads 3. All right, thus concludes my hot take on cleanness. If you've read the novel and you have similar or completely opposite reactions to any of the questions I answered today, please let me know about them in the comments below. All right, to wrap things up, I prepared a series of questions for my buddy reader, Leo, over at A Little Book Life. His responses to them should already be posted on his channel right now as you're watching this. So if you just want to skip right over to his video and hear the responses as well, follow that link down there. But just in case you can't get enough of my soothing baritone, I'll read them for you here as well. Question one. The final third of the book finds the narrator returning to many of his old sexual practices, riskier stuff that leaves him feeling conflicted about why he wants the things that he wants. It seems pretty obvious we're supposed to be viewing this through the lens of his relationship with R, comparing and contrasting, looking for signs of growth. Did you feel like this central, monogamous, clean romance at the core of the book complicated or enriched the explorations of sex that were presented at the end? See, it's not just in my own responses that I can't stop talking. Even my questions are 
paragraph length for some reason. Question two. It seems worth taking a closer look at the narrator's concept of cleanness, since, after all, it is the title of the book, and it rhymes with penis. This is a fact that always bears repeating. It's a fairly abstract concept the narrator uses to sum up the unique sexual dynamic he feels with R, but it's never explained or explored in much detail, unless I really miss something. Beyond the sense of shame the narrator associates with all the other sex he's ever had ever, why? Cleanness shares some connotations with other problematic facets of the gay community today. Prejudice against men who are HIV positive, and widespread crystal meth use immediately jump to mind. What did you make of the cleanness in this book? Was it a meaningful or useful concept for exploring gay sexual identity? And bonus question, what are some other fun words that rhyme with penis? Question three. The last section of the book leaves our narrator in a moment of extreme vulnerability, without many specific plans for the future, and also cuddling a puppy. Given the open-endedness of that conclusion, what do you think is going to stick with you most about the novel? Any obvious takeaways, themes, scenes, stylistic choices? Also, as a lifelong dog owner, how would you rate the narrator's puppy cuddling technique? And of course, this discussion couldn't be complete if we also didn't get Leo's final verdict on cleanness. All right, weirdos. That's all I have to talk about today. As always, your comments and support are greatly appreciated. I respectfully beseech all of you to like, comment, and subscribe to all associated videos and channels within this discussion. And until next time, happy reading, weirdos. You're a permanent figure, a jacked up sorrow. I want you to love me. You send me a coffin of roses. I guess that's the way that things go these days. Two pills for